Welcome to Sovereign BTC, your guide to the practical side of everyday Bitcoin use. I'm your host, John Bush, and we have a great program lined up for you today. This will be the second edition of Sovereign BTC. We participated in the Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast contest, and we didn't come out on top, but we came pretty close. We had uh, quite a few actual votes. I want to thank everyone who participated and donated their Bitcoin What a fine example of using Bitcoin as a voting system. I was pretty excited about that. Well, the Let's Talk Bitcoin guys like the show so much, they offered us a spot on their upcoming Let's Talk Bitcoin network, and we are very excited and grateful to be a part of it. So I'm going to be bringing you this program once a week, one hour podcast. I hope you like it. Hope you'll share it with your friends. We got a lot of stuff to talk about, lots of news, views, tips, and tools you can use to use Bitcoin to benefit your life. And today the show is absolutely jam-packed. We're going to share with you a clip from Coast to Coast. Many people may be familiar with Coast to Coast AM. It's heard by millions and millions of people across the country. It's probably the most popular talk radio program in the world. My wife and I had the pleasure of going on the program several weeks ago, a couple months ago actually, and one of the things that we talked about in the two-hour interview was Bitcoin. We're going to share that clip with you. We're also going to be chatting with Justice Ranveer. He's an Austin Bitcoin expert and enthusiast that's helping to organize the Texas Bitcoin Conference. You know what they say, everything's bigger in Texas. This hopes to be the biggest Bitcoin conference yet. We're going to be chatting with him about the ins and outs and what's going down with that conference, who's going to be speaking, where it's at, and how you can participate and join us. Uh, Again, my wife and I will be speaking at that event, and we're excited to be a part of it. We're also going to be bringing you the Bitcoin Tip of the Week, which will be a weekly feature on this program, along with the Bitcoin Quote of the Week. We talk with Daniel Krywitz. He is a libertarian, anarchist, agorist, and he's got a lot of good stuff to share with us. Some insights on how the blockchain can be used, not just as a medium of exchange, but all sorts of other ways that it can benefit people's lives. And this is one of the reasons why I think Bitcoin is going to be adopted mainstream. There's so many uses for the Bitcoin system besides money. I'm excited to explore the revolutionary possibilities. We're also going to be chatting with Jeffrey Tucker. That's our featured interview of the program. We chat with Jeffrey Tucker about how he got into Bitcoin, why he thinks it's so important, and also the broader implications that Bitcoin plays in the building of a free society. I hope you'll enjoy this program. You can check out our website at SovereignBTC.com. Find us on Twitter at SovBTC. And find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash SovereignBTC. Without further ado, here's this week's Bitcoin news powered by the Liberty Beat. Well, thank you, John. I'm Brian Hagan. And starting things off in your Bitcoin news this week, a new investment company based in San Francisco began accepting Bitcoin this week. Realty Shares allows investors to avoid delays in transaction fees usually involved with real estate transactions. CEO Nav Athwal said that 15 to 20 percent of his customer base is global, and allowing them to use Bitcoin will remove the need for multiple wire transfers and fees. Call it another first for Bitcoin as a major United States newspaper plans to accept the digital currency for payment. In an apparent attempt to gain new subscribers to their digital content, the Chicago Sun-Times plans to test a social paywall for their content with Bitcoin accepted for access. As a form of payment, readers will also be allowed to tweet about the Taproot Foundation, a business talent organization. Sun-Times editor-in-chief and publisher Jim Kirk says his paper is the first major paper to test a Bitcoin-based paywall. Australian State News ran a report on Bitcoin discussing details of around 100 Bitcoin ATMs set to be distributed. Although Australian regulators have yet to issue any formal guidelines, the company, Australian Bitcoin, ATMs will be working to release the teller machines later this year. Bitcoin businesses have been a recent focus after high-profile arrests of Bitcoin proponents. Last year, Bitcoin payment processor CoinJar was shut down by the Australian government. Later, the National Australia Bank offered to help the company manage its business. Chinese Bitcoin exchange BTC China has restored a facility which allows the purchase of Bitcoin by depositing yuan into the corporate bank account of the exchange. The Wall Street Journal reports the move reverses December's decision to halt such deposits following a memo from the People's Bank of China warning against the trading of Bitcoin. Russia is no fan of Bitcoin. With the Russian Central Bank, issuing a statement warning that virtual currencies are illegal under the country's federal law. Russia Today reports the top financial regulator calls Bitcoin a risk that could be connected to gangs, terrorism, and money laundering. 
The anti-Bitcoin stance follows bans against the virtual currency imposed by China and Denmark. Thanks to Brian Hagen and thanks to the Liberty Beat crew for supplying us with this week's Bitcoin news. You can check out more Liberty news and activist updates at thelibertybeat.com. Next, we're going to hear an excerpt from an interview that my wife Catherine Bleich and I did on Coast to Coast AM. This was a few months back. We were being interviewed about the program we're putting together, the reality-based television show called Sovereign Living. Essentially, the philosophy of Sovereign Living holds that individuals, families, and communities should not rely on centralized or coercive institutions in order to fulfill their wants and needs and solve their common problems. That's part of the reason why we're calling this podcast Sovereign BTC. See, I feel like Bitcoin is a wonderful example of an institution that doesn't rely on government in order to work, in order to benefit people's lives. So many people feel that government is necessary in order to have an adequate medium of exchange, or a central bank is even necessary. Unfortunately, a lot of people believe that as well. But here we have Bitcoin, a decentralized peer-to-peer network that... You don't have to trust one centralized institution in order to exchange money, in order to exchange value. And I think that is really revolutionary and evolutionary. And one thing that I'm hoping to do through my work with the Sovereign BTC podcast, with Sovereign Living Show, and just espousing the philosophy of sovereign living in general, is to teach people, to demonstrate people, to people, to inspire people. To show that, check, take a look at Bitcoin. Here is an example, living proof of a decentralized institution that doesn't rely on centralized or coercive government in order to function properly. If we can do it with Bitcoin, why can't we do it with healthcare? Why can't we do it with education? Why can't we do it with justice or with defense even? Some of the things that we touched on in the larger interview with Coast to Coast and somebody called in and was talking about money and the Federal Reserve System and how we're all slaves to money and debt. And I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to bring up Bitcoin. And I did. I had the awesome opp- opportunity. feel really blessed to have the opportunity to chat with the, with the people on Coast to Coast. But I feel even better about the idea that I got the message of Bitcoin out to millions of people. This may be one of the biggest uh, mediums that Bitcoin's been pushed out there. It was, it was brief, short and sweet. But nonetheless, we got the message of Bitcoin out to the masses, and uh, we heard a lot of good feedback, positive feedback. People had not heard about Bitcoin before this interview. They got in touch with us after the program. So we're excited to, to show you and share with you that interview here on the Sovereign BTC podcast. So without further ado, here is an excerpt from the Coast to Coast AM interview that Catherine and I did with John B. Wells. It's all about Bitcoin. Check it out. Hope you like it. There's all sorts of exciting opportunities that we have now, especially with the technology the way that it is. And and uh, we personally do everything we can to limit the use of Federal Reserve notes. We try to engage in as many economic transactions as we can without using dollars because we believe that using Federal Reserve notes gives value to the Federal Reserve System, which in turn gives credence to them printing money out of thin air, which in turn gives credence to them bailing out the big corporations and, and funding multiple wars of aggression all at the same time. We're big fans of Bitcoin. Uh, we like to trade in Bitcoin. We like to receive Bitcoin. We like to exchange Bitcoin for good and services. Uh, for those not familiar with Bitcoin, it's a cryptocurrency that's traded online. It's uh, close to being anonymous. It's so easy to use. You can transfer money worldwide, globally. And uh, I think it has an opportunity to really undermine the central banking system. We all have the choice in our lives to choose to work for an employer that only pays FRNs or choose to live in a place where we can only pay off our ends. But it takes a little bit of work and some foresight and, and uh, you know, thinking outside of the box. But slowly but surely, we could reduce our use and dependence on this monetary system by engaging in barter, by investing in, in junk silver and using that. Like, for example, we trade our uh, a dozen eggs for a silver dime. We're bringing back the old... Uh, the old notion of a dime a dozen. Of course, silver right. dimes are worth like $2.50 right now. But uh, I think that there's many things that people can do to get out from underneath the control. And we don't necessarily have to participate in their monetary monopoly. We may, it may be difficult, and we may not be able to have a car note or, or work a big corporate job. 
but we can make changes in our everyday lifestyle and we could opt out of these systems and begin using the alternatives that are already available to us. And I think Bitcoin's a great one. People can learn more about Bitcoin at weusecoins.com or this really cool informa- uh, organization, Bitcoin Not Bombs, that's trying to encourage Bitcoin use in the nonprofit sector for, for philanthropy. But I think all that stuff, I think it's, it's dying. It's on its way out. There's new forms of doing things. There's new technologies. And I'm really excited to take part in, in exploring that and growing that. Well, John, tell us a little bit about that here. Now, I've heard about this Bitcoin thing, and, and we're, we're going to do a program on it uh, in the very near future. But to, just how do you get some Bitcoins to start trading? I mean, is this sort of like an electronic barter town out of Thunderdome, or what, what do we got here? <laughs> Well, the, the best way to receive, first of all, you can set up a wallet. It's an online wallet. It can exist either on your physical hard drive on a computer or there's some online services that are easier to use, in my opinion, like blockchain.info. All you do is go up, pop in your email, put a password, and before you know it, you have a wallet. In order to receive Bitcoins, you can go to Bitcoin exchanges like bitstamp.net or uh, mtgox, Mt. Gox. And you can purchase Bitcoins with Federal Reserve notes or any other central currency for that matter. Uh, The best way, in my opinion, to receive the Bitcoins is to offer a good or service for the Bitcoins. Say that you're a plumber, say you do web development, uh, or as we do with the eggs. Simply trade them for goods or services, then you're bringing in Bitcoin without having to first purchase them, which could be a barrier to entry. But it, it's a little complicated. There's a little bit of a, a of a, a learning curve to get over. But once you you use it, I mean, I pay a people. This woman that helps with marketing, her name's Megan. She helps marketing for the Center for Natural Living, and I pay her with Bitcoin. It's so much easier than writing a check or doing a wire transfer or using PayPal. The fees are so much lower. So once you get over that learning curve, I really think the phenomenal value that lies with Bitcoin is is the simplicity to transfer money instantly with minimal fee. And I think it do has it does have the opportunity to render credit card banking systems and, and these other forms of, of monetary exchange irrelevant, and they'll be left in the dust. So it's, now, John, I know you're not an economist, but what will this do to the if enough people start using this? Have we two question two part question? Have we just exchanged one or, or traded one medium of exchange for another? And number two, what would it do if if a sufficient number of people <laughs> started using the Bitcoin system? We, the people down here, and, and um, the 99 percenters down here, I, I take it that would collapse the current economic system, or would they just go, okay, let's go with the, let's go with the Bitcoin thing. The operation doesn't skip a beat. What would happen? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, it, slowly but surely, if, if more people participated and, and stopped using the Federal Reserve note, then yes, the, the Federal Reserve system uh, would collapse uh, in on itself. And, and that's something that I think is one of the values of uh, using Bitcoin, the capability that it has. If, if, if people, get, everyone says, oh, the Federal Reserve note is worthless. If you really think it's worthless, then you can send me your Federal Reserve notes and, and I'll find value in them. But the value no, isn't okay. in that it's backed by a commodity, and neither is Bitcoin. The value is that people identify it and use it as a medium of exchange. Now, the cool thing, if Bitcoin were to become the norm, Bitcoin isn't controlled by a central institution that can use arbitrary dictates and and, and benefits to their buddies in the good old boy network we've been talking about for the past oh, few gotcha. hours. It's uh, completely decentralized. It's open source. People can no code. There's no There's interest. N- no mm. centralized manipulation. It's all open source, and uh, there's really no way to manipulate it. So the value will be determined on how many people are purchasing it, how many people are exchanging it, and uh, if it were to become the norm, uh, I think we would find a lot more freedom. They wouldn't be able to finance all these foreign wars, and it would be more stable of a currency. It's it's unstable now because it's new, which of course mm-hmm. would come along with any new currency. Uh, sure. But as it becomes more mainstream, it will stabilize and it could totally replace the dollar and every other centralized currency for that matter. Yeah, I'm not so sure about the war thing though. You know, where there's a will, there's a weapon. We were really excited to get that message out to so many people and we heard back from a lot of people after the interview that had a lot more questions about Bitcoin and a lot of the different topics that we discussed. As I said before, you can hear the full interview at SovereignLiving.com down there on the podcast feed on the left side of the page. Next, we're going to move to our Bitcoin Tip of the Week. Tagline of this program is your guide to the practical side of everyday Bitcoin use. So every week, we're going to be bringing you a tip that will help you to utilize Bitcoin in a more effective and efficient manner. And here's this week's Bitcoin Tip of the Week. 
Did you know you can store your bitcoins on paper? A paper wallet is a simple way to back up your funds and have them ready to import to any bitcoin wallet of your choosing. To do this, simply scan your private keys QR code using your wallet's import function. Blockchain.info's paper wallets print you a record of your public and private keys along with your blockchain wallet identifier and mnemonic to recover your password. Be sure to store your paper wallet safely because whomever has access to your private key can claim your bitcoins. This week's Bitcoin Tip of the Week was brought to you by Blockchain.info, the world's most popular Bitcoin wallet. Simple and secure, Blockchain is the easiest way to get started using Bitcoin. To learn more or to create a wallet today, visit Blockchain.info. I gotta tell you, I'm really excited to be a part of the Austin Bitcoin movement. I'm going to go ahead and declare it here, folks. You may live in New Hampshire, New York City, or L.A., but I'm declaring it. You ready? Austin, Texas is the Bitcoin capital of the world. Not only do we have a huge weekly meetup that meets every Sunday from 7 to 9 p.m. at Schultz's Beer Garden with 50, 60, 70 people in attendance, but there's a whole slew of businesses that accept Bitcoin as well, uh, maybe a couple dozen or more. There's also a number, a large number of really big startups here in in Austin, Texas. Uh, Cointerra is one of the major ones. Cloudhashing.com also has offices here, and there's a whole slew of other ones. The movement is growing very far and large. We have the state's first uh, gun dealership that accepts Bitcoin. That's pretty exciting. Shout out to Michael Cargill in Central Texas Gunworks. Everything's really happening here in Austin, and I'm excited to be a part of the upcoming Texas Bitcoin Conference. Uh, we're going to chat with Justice Ranveer about that event. He's one of the organizers. He's one of the organizers of the Bitcoin meetup here in town as well. He's also an expert and enthusiast. Does a lot of work with localbitcoins.com as well. We sat down and chatted with Justin about the upcoming conference, and we encourage you guys to attend if you're looking to see what a Bitcoin conference is all about. What a better place to start than here in Austin, Texas. Check out this interview with Justice Ranveer. We're joined by Justice Ranveer. He's a Bitcoin expert and enthusiast. You can find him at the regular Austin Bitcoin meetups every Sunday, 7 o'clock at Schultz's Beer Garden. He also happens to be one of the organizers of the upcoming Texas Bitcoin Conference, which looks to be like it's going to be quite the affair. A lot of great speakers, awesome venue, and uh, myself, I'll be speaking along with my wife, Catherine. We're excited to be a part of it. Justice, thanks for joining us. Why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about how you got into Bitcoin? I believe it was uh, late 2009, I started to hear about Bitcoin on some of the tech forums that I was a part of, uh, Slashdot specifically. And I saw it uh, early on, it looked kind of interesting, and I just kind of said, oh, you know, that's cool, and went on about my business. A few months later, I see some comment where somebody mentions that Bitcoins actually have an exchange rate, and they're trading for more than the cost of electricity to mine them. And that was uh, sometime early 2010, and I thought, wow, okay, there's something more to this. And that's when I started digging in deeper and uh, fell down the rabbit hole, and here I am. Nice. Haven't looked back ever since. So you're helping to organize this Texas Bitcoin conference. Tell us about it. When is it going to be? Who's going to be speaking? What are you guys hoping to accomplish with this conference? It looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Right. Uh, it started out as a much smaller affair. Uh, so our the local Austin meetup group, we were doing regular weekly meetings, and once a month we were trying to do something a bit more organized. And in October, we were thinking, well, what are we going to do? We probably won't be able to do these uh, larger events during the, uh, during the holiday season, so why don't we try to do something a little bit bigger than normal in the spring? Well, uh, that got the ball rolling, and it turned out to, a con to a, what, what we're hoping is going to be one of the largest conferences yet. Uh, it's March 5th and 6th. The, uh, it was designed to be right before South by Southwest so that people can come to both events during the same weekend. Originally, it was just going to be the 6th, and that's when all the main speakers are, but we got so much content that we actually have to uh, start a day early. That's great. Yeah, tell us who are some of the speakers going to be. Uh, well, uh, you already mentioned yourself and Catherine. Uh, we got some local businesses. We've got Cointerra. We'll be presenting conformal systems. Um, we've got uh, a lot of big name Bitcoin and libertarian speakers. We've got uh, Stefan Molyneux, Jeff Berwick, Jeffrey Tucker, 
Jeffrey Tucker and tech experts in the mining and uh, alternative cryptocurrencies world. We've got all of the hosts of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Nice. And uh, too many more to name. That's great. That's great. Now, I just saw today there's going to be some sort of Bitcoin con- uh, concert. What's that all about? Okay. Uh, there's been, uh, especially in the, the last few months, there's been a big uptick in interest among artists about Bitcoin. So the at the end of the conference will be the first Bit concert. It's a concert where tickets will be sold only for Bitcoins. Nice. So far, we have Carolyn Malachi, Jordan Page, and Tatiana Moroz as our artists, uh, with possibly more to come. That's great. That sounds cool. Yeah, so I guess you'll have a pretty cool crowd there if only uh, Bitcoin holders are going to be allowed in. Uh, this venue, Circuit of the Americas, I, you know... First of all, full disclosure, I'm not a big fan of the place because they take a lot of public money, but it looks freaking awesome, and I can bet that it's a really cool place to put on a conference. Tell us about the venue. Why is this special, and what's extraordinary about this joint? Well, um, it's a new facility. It's the Circuit of Americas. Gr- huge amounts of space, uh, a lot of good amenities to it. Uh, honestly, it's a bit further from the center of town than we'd like, but because of the date we chose, we pretty much had to do it in a non-traditional venue. Yeah, there, there's so much space that we're going to be able to have five simultaneous events, uh, the three main speaking tracks, and then workshops, tutorials, and other types of presentations all going on at the same time. That's great. Lots of exhibition space, uh, plenty of room for all of the people that we think are going to show up. Uh, we've tried to... T- we tried to organize this based on our experiences at other Bitcoin conferences. At the other conferences, everybody wants to get into small groups and chat and share new ideas. So we've picked a place that's going to have lots of seating area for that kind of thing. That's great. Excellent, excellent. So tell us, where can people get more information about the conference and where can people buy tickets? Uh, our primary website is texasbitcoinconference.com. That's where uh, most of the announcements are. You can also follow us on Twitter at Texas Bitcoin. And uh, we have a Facebook page all linked from our website. Excellent. All right, Justice. Ticket sales are on TexasBitcoinConference.com. Uh, right on. Well, thanks for joining us and thanks for the great info. I'm looking forward to the conference and hope the listeners can come join as well. I want to make a couple quick announcements about some upcoming Liberty Conferences that you might be interested in attending. They'll be crawling with Bitcoin enthusiasts and speakers that are going to be talking about Bitcoin and and how it benefits our push to create a more free society. Coming up on February 15th and 16th, the Freedom Summit will be taking place in Phoenix, Arizona. That's being put on by Ernie Hancock and the folks at Freedoms Phoenix. Uh, Catherine and I will be speaking. We'll be screening the docu-reality television program, Sovereign Living. So definitely check that out. You can find more information about that at freedomsummit.com. And then Liberty Forum, which is, uh, you'll hear later in the program, we talked to Jeffrey Tucker, and he actually says that that's where he really heard about Bitcoin, was turned on to Bitcoin in major ways with all the Bitcoin fans that were there, took him out to lunch and, and schooled him on what Bitcoin was all about. He says that he was resistant at first. But nonetheless, that's where I was really turned on and exposed to Bitcoin in major ways as well. They had the Bitcoin ATM out there. That hopes to be a really phenomenal event. If you're into Bitcoin, you'll definitely appreciate that event. That's taking place February 22nd and 23rd of this year. You can get information on that at freestateproject.com. So definitely check out those two events. They'll have a lot to do with Bitcoin and a lot to do with the cause of freedom overall. Right now, we're going to play an interview that we did with Daniel Krywitz. He is also based in Austin, Texas. He's an expert on cryptography and Bitcoin, a bit of an agorist as well. He writes for the Mises Circle blog. We talked to Daniel about the exciting uses of the Bitcoin blockchain outside of just your typical money transfer. A lot of people think Bitcoin is limited to just a medium of exchange, but there's so much more. There's so many possibilities that are opened up with the Bitcoin network, with the Bitcoin system, and I'm excited to learn more about them. Check out this interview we did with Daniel Krywitz on how people can use the blockchain in order to benefit their lives in ways besides just a medium of exchange. So, Daniel, why don't you start by telling us how you got into Bitcoin and why Bitcoin is so exciting for you? Okay, well, um, well, I first learned about Bitcoin in 2010, which I got more into it then, 
uh, but I just sort of put it on my list of interesting things to keep track of. And then when I next heard of it, it was like several times more expensive. Well, many, many times. Hmm. This was early in the 2011 mania. That's when I first uh, got some. I just sort of thought of them as kind of a, a weird speculation at first. What such a cool idea. I mean, um, the libertarians are always looking for ways to... Um, ways to replace the dollar, and if this thing did it, it would be the greatest uh, investment in history. But, uh, and starting in 2012, that's when I started really getting into the crypto anarchy movement, the cypherpunk stuff, and I started really understanding the historical roots of Bitcoin and how it works, and it was in early 2013 that I decided to do Bitcoin stuff pretty much full time nice. because I, I realized that the Bitcoin community was so fanatical that they were not going to let this thing die under any circumstances. Yeah, it's huge. It's revolutionary and evolutionary. Now, at the heart of the Bitcoin network is what's known as the blockchain, which is essentially a public ledger that keeps track of every single Bitcoin transaction, no matter how big or how small. Tell us, what are some of the uses of the blockchain besides simply a transfer of value or a money, so to speak, a public ledger for those transactions? What else is the blockchain currently being used for? And let's also talk about what what are some of the things that are on the cutting edge of development and in innovation for the Bitcoin blockchain. But maybe you could just start by telling us how you would describe the Bitcoin blockchain. Okay, well, I mean, the Bitcoin blockchain is, is a, a public consensus network. That's how I would describe it. It is a means of establishing a consensus over a a large group of people who do not necessarily uh, who, who may have the short term incentive to try to cheat. It, it essentially m makes it so that people people have to um, play fairly. The applications of this idea are basically any, any human social relations, any, any property assignments. So like instead of a public ledger that is an institution that, that the state can take over, mm -hmm. in, instead you, you would have a consensus network that could say who owns which land, you know, who is in charge of some business or, or whatever. All of that can be done in a consensus network, although the, the Bitcoin consensus network doesn't do all of that yet, but theoretically that's what you should think that the applications are. Okay. So one thing that you can do with Bitcoin right now is establish the existence of a document at a particular time. You can, you can timestamp a digital signature in a way that's provable, which was quite difficult before. Nice. Another thing that you can do is um, if you digitally sign a document, there is a way that you can repudiate the signature, and that's by publishing your private keys. Then you can say, um, I didn't sign it, see, I, I published the keys. So if you establish, um, the, way, the way that Bitcoin can fix this is if you sign the document with a Bitcoin private key that has a lot of Bitcoins in it, then you can be pretty sure that you didn't, that nobody published the private keys at that point, because if, if you did, then, then you would lose all of that money. And, and of course, then you also put the hash in the blockchain so that you, you timestamp it. So there's more security to digital signatures. Uh, theoretically, I'm not sure of anybody actually using that application yet, but you could do it. Uh, Namecoin does some interesting things. Name, Namecoin is theoretically capable of replacing the DNS system. Mm -hmm. And this, this is the um, association between IP addresses and domain names. So if you go to, you know, freestateproject.org or something, that's associated with a, an IP address and you have to look it up on a, a server that, that follows the consensus created by, I think it's I, ICANN that mm -hmm. does it. They're, they're a UN, UN controlled nonprofit organization, basically, basically status. Na Namecoin is capable of replacing that. Nice. I, it, it can also be used for authentication. 
So in, in cryptography, there's sort of this inherent problem of you have a, a private key that is, you know, you, you can use it to, to digitally sign documents and encrypt things, and it's supposed to be associated with a certain person, but it's quite difficult to prove that it's actually associated with the the person that is claimed to have it. So you can you can you can do authentication with Namecoin because you can register a name with a public key. Uh, th- th- it's harder to perform a, a man in the middle attack and and pretend to be somebody else. Right on. What about uh, you and Daniel? Have been doing a lot of work with uh, contracts using the blockchain. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Okay. Well, um, Bitcoin has a number of uh, built-in features that allow for um, more than just the standard transaction where I send you some bitcoins. Uh, you, there are escrow transactions, well, escrow addresses, essentially. So you send some bitcoins to an address that cannot be redeemed unless there are a certain number of digital signatures. So these are called M of N, and you you set up, say, three people, and the transaction cannot be redeemed unless at least two of them sign it. So you can use this for, for escrow, and the escrow service will not be able to redeem the coins for themselves. They can act purely as the escrow. Nice. There's also a neat idea called uh, an assurance contract that you can uh, you can create, although it doesn't work yet. They haven't turned it on yet. And it's basically like Kickstarter. It's a transaction that is not valid until a certain amount has been, um, until the sum of the transaction is a certain amount. So anybody can add more coins to the transaction, but it's not valid until it reaches a certain amount. Nice. Well, that's exciting. Now, um, a, a smart contract is really a much more general idea. You can't have a contract until you actually have some sort of consequences. So some something that punishes you if you violate it, or some something that some some kind of value that makes it meaningful. So, for example, I could um, put out a, a bond, and if I fail to uh, abide by the the terms of some service that, mm-hmm. that that we agree to, then I lose the bond. Nice. That's in, now that's impossible if you without a a digital value. Essentially, you you can't you can't do something like that unless you actually have something that's valuable online. Uh, otherwise, the contract has to be to be backed mm-hmm. by some physical asset. Okay. Another example of of a protocol that uh, can establish consensus is called open transactions. So it works. It doesn't have a blockchain. It works quite differently from Bitcoin uh, because it's mainly for transacting receipts in uh, liabilities for for physical assets or fiat currencies. But it also will be integrated with with Bitcoin. And you can do any kind of uh, smart contract with this. Uh, once, Once we get open transactions plus Bitcoin together, this will be sort of the realization of the dreams of the early cypherpunks. So what you can do with with open transactions is say you're a, a bank or a Bitcoin exchange or some some institution that will have accounts from clients. You you can have your clients' accounts that will always uh, a, a, and they will always add up to the the correct amount and and you won't have the ability to change people's accounts. In other words, you can act as a financial service without without your clients having to trust you because you're only able to uh, 
you're only able to verify receipts, but they, the, the clients have to provide the digital signatures in order to, um, in order to change their own balances. Essentially, um, right now, if you have bitcoins in an exchange or in a web wallet like Coinbase, thing, anything like that, the, the institution can just disappear and run off with your bitcoin. And it's, it, most, most exchanges, well, all exchanges that I know of are actually, um, you don't, you don't even have a web wallet. It's, it's really just a number that's sort of assigned to you in, in their database. And now we, you know, we have this problem with mountain docks where they're not letting people take their bitcoins out of the exchange. That sort of thing would be impossible once these institutions begin using open transactions. Nice. And once once one institution does it, then everybody will have to. And this will spill over into the non-bitcoin world too, because people will start saying. These Bitcoin companies, you know, they, they can't arbitrarily change my balance or run off with the Bitcoins. Why, why, why do I have that security with them, but I can't have it with, uh, with ordinary banks? Well, Daniel, thanks for chatting with us about all these uses of the blockchain. It seems like we're only on the cutting edge. We're on, on the brink of all these new uses, and I think it's pretty exciting what the future holds. Now we're going to get you this week's Bitcoin quote of the week. And this one is pretty good. It's pretty intense as well. I really like the way that Roger Ver, many people know him as Bitcoin Jesus, I like the way he put this. He was asked by a reporter with the New York Times to comment on Charlie Shrem's case. Many people in the Bitcoin world are familiar with the fact that Charlie Shrem was arrested recently and is being charged with some sort of money laundering. Um, I see it as a victimless crime, and Roger Ver agrees with me. Here's a, here's what he told the reporter, and I think this is really exciting and profound, and I uh, appreciate the way that he kind of flips the script on the New York Times reporter to demonstrate really what the problem is with the case of Charlie Shrem here. He says, I won't comment directly on the details of Charlie's case, but I would like to point out that even if he has done everything he is accused of, he still hasn't done anything morally wrong. Politicians writing down words on a piece of paper and calling it a law does nothing to alter morality. People own their own bodies and have the absolute right to put anything they want into it. People like the FBI and DEA agents who want to lock people in cages for bullying, selling, or using drugs are the ones committing evil and they need to stop. I look forward to the day when they see the error of their ways and stop committing evil acts in the name of law enforcement. Very nicely put, Roger Ver. Um, couldn't have said it better myself. It's even more ridiculous when you point out the fact that the DEA and the FBI are working in concert to ship drugs into the United States, um, shipping cocaine. There's a whole slew of research how the CIA was working along with FBI and DEA to bring drugs into the country. It's what, in large part what spurred the crack co- cocaine epidemic. So anytime I hear any bit about the drug war, especially when they're locking people up for apparently laundering Bitcoin for so people can get drugs in a safe way. I just think about the utter hypocrisy that the very federal agencies that are going after people, prosecuting people, locking people in cages, many of them are the same agencies that are in large part responsible for the epidemic of crack cocaine and some of the worst drugs out there. So just wanted to throw that out there. This was this week's, so that was this week's Bitcoin quote of the week. Now we're going to go to our featured interview with Jeffrey Tucker of Liberty Me and Lise Fair Books. I really appreciate Jeffrey Tucker for everything he does, his insights, his ability to communicate the philosophy of liberty, and I was so excited to see him get on board the Bitcoin gravy train. Uh, He's excited about Bitcoin. He's pumped up about it, and in my opinion, he's one of the best Bitcoin enthusiasts and proponents out there. He's waking a lot of people up to see the true value of this cryptocurrency. We chat with him about how he got into Bitcoin, what he thinks Bitcoin is useful for, what value he sees in Bitcoin, and we talk about the broader implications that the Bitcoin network and using Bitcoin has in creating a more free society. Without further ado, here's the Sovereign BTC interview with Jeffrey Tucker. We're now joined by Jeffrey Tucker. He's the CEO of Liberty.me and the executive editor of Lise Fair Books. And he just so happens to be one heck of a Bitcoin proponent, uh, espousing 
all sorts of goodies about how benef- uh, Bitcoin can benefit your life and the, the broader implications about how Bitcoin can help create a free society. We're going to be chatting about that and more today, joined by Jeffrey Tucker. Jeffrey, how you doing? Hey, John, it's so great for you to have me on your show, and it's, <clears throat> it's really nice to hear your voice. It's been a while since we've seen each other, I think. Yeah, it's been too long. It's always too long, but we always seem to run each other, run into each other all these fabulous Liberty Conferences, and I'm a big fan. I was already a big fan of yours, and I'm really excited to have such a strong, inspiring, insightful voice uh, pr- espousing the, the benefits of Bitcoin, so it's exciting yeah. to see you on board. Well, I guess you were way ahead of me on this one, were you? So it's about a year now since I've been interested in Bitcoin. You know, I, I, I followed it for a, the previous two years, but, you know, there's something a little bit forbidding about the topic. It seems like, oh, I can't possibly understand this. It's too complicated. But it's about a year ago that I got, um, you know, really confronted with the whole thing. I accepted my first Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin was like $12, $14, something like that. Mm-hmm. And then I really threw myself into a study of it. And then I was just amazed. And so, of course, you get hooked, right? Because it's such a better system Mm -hmm. and it's a sounder money. And it's so free market. You know, it just fits right in with the way I see the world and you too. Yeah, for sure. I think we're probably about the same pace. I recall just being aware of Bitcoin. There's a lot of chatter of it, but I didn't take the time to to buy in or to actually dig deep into it. And I remember being there at Liberty Forum last year, which Liberty Forum's coming right up around the corner again, but was that the first time that you were really exposed to it or that that you really um, turned on to it, Major? Yeah, it was at at Liberty Forum because we had a bunch of Bitcoiners there, you remember? Uh And they kind of, uh, they were interesting. They they took me to lunch. I, I kind of resisted them. Like they surrounded me early on in the conference and said, we're going to teach about Bitcoin. I was like, <laughs> you know, I really just don't want to be, you know, uh, sort of you know, sat down and schooled by you guys, really. <clears throat> I didn't, you know, but then they did. They did. They took me to lunch and then had me download a wallet and just gave it to me and explained it to me. And, and it changed uh, everything for me. It was that event because then I sold some bow ties for Bitcoin. <laughs> Right, you know, and then I thought, well, this is a kind of an amazing way to get money um, because it transfers immediately and without any fees, and you really feel it arriving, and you suddenly have a sense that, oh, this is the way a monetary system is supposed to work. Yeah. So I, I left and then threw myself into a study of it, and I just, you know, I discovered the things like uh, the absence of um, double spending, you know, the non-inflationary nature of it, how how the blockchain, you know, is constantly resolving itself so that you have a clear title to all Bitcoin. And I realized, oh, this is basically the ideal money. You know, this yeah. is what but it was put together here. And it's just a little bit mind-blowing. I had to kind of take a detour to understand something about cryptography so I could explain it well. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, you, you can fall pretty pretty deep down the rabbit hole with Bitcoin. It opens up all sorts of other insights and other windows to explore. But uh, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And I didn't really buy into it, so to speak, maybe literally and figuratively, until I actually used it in, as a payment system. I operate the Liberty Beat, the daily uh, Liberty News and Activist Updates uh, radio news service. And I pay my people with the Bitcoin. And whenever I used it as a payment, because before one of the people, he does agorism. He wants to stay off book. So I was using a Western Union to wire transfer money. Not only did I have to go to the local grocery store, but I also had crazy exorbitant fees that I ended up gobbling up on my end. But when I started using Bitcoin, I mean, the simplicity of it all and just how easy it was and how fast it was is is really what got me hooked onto it. Did you have like a catalyzing moment, like a eureka moment that really turned you into the proponent that you are today? Yeah, once I began to realize the difference between a money that's really traded as property and and payment systems that rely fundamentally on trust relationships, that's that's what turned it for me. Because you you begin to realize that 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 the whole system has more or less been hacked. The, the current system, the, the national monetary system, has been hacked to work for an internet age, but it doesn't work very well. So we think we're spending money when we pull out a credit card. We're actually not. What we're mm-hmm. doing is coughing up our identities, and then we enter into trust relationships with third parties who enter into other trust relationships with other third parties. The whole thing is so vulnerable to fraud, mm-hmm. identity theft. And, and, and this is the reason for the high fees. You know, it's, it's not that Visa and MasterCard and PayPal and bank transfers 
or else it want to rip you off or slow you down. You know, that's not the idea. Uh, the reason is that they don't have a good technology for making money transfer well. Mm-hmm. And, and Bitcoin is a completely different system. You know, it's not just, you know, another version of, of, of uh, the Discover card or something like that, which mm-hmm. I don't think people really get initially. They think it's, it's yet another a way to pay. I mean, it is another way to pay, but it, it operates on a completely different principle, not of, of trusting who you are, uh, making sure you have a bank account, making sure you've got a credit card that you pay your bills, all this nonsense. Uh, or what your IP address is, which is not a problem for those in the U.S., but many people around the world can't use credit cards just because they live in the wrong neighborhood, mm-hmm. right? So uh, Bitcoin just dispenses with a whole third-party element and makes all exchanges just peer-to-peer. You're really trading real property, not your identity, not a trust relationship, but the real thing. And you know, that's why there's no chargebacks. Uh, so I, when I realized that, uh, I began to see that in a very strange way, what Bitcoin does is it, it restores money to what money was before the government took it over, mm-hmm. and it combines that with the most advanced technology of the 21st century digital age, you know, and combines these two together to give us basically a globalized, weightless, and spaceless, perfect gold standard kind of, kind of system. That's I mean, it's, right. it's unbelievable. The gold standard of money without having to use gold. Yeah, it's revolutionary and evolutionary. So the tagline for this podcast, the Sovereign BTC Show, is your guide to the practical side of everyday Bitcoin use. So in your opinion, what are some of the practical benefits that your everyday uh, world citizen or world individual, to hell with the citizenry, uh, what are some of the benefits that they could take from Bitcoin, in your opinion? What are the biggest benefits for the little guy? Well, being able to spend it without any transaction fees is, is, is huge, actually, to, to send and receive it. I think that that alone is amazing. I mean, I was just sent just yesterday some money on PayPal, and I was shocked at the fees, which I, I don't know exactly, but uh, it seemed like it was 4 or 5 6% or more. You know, it was big. I mean, you, you're basically seeing fees take a bite out of the money you're getting. Mm-hmm. Bitcoin, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. So everyone wants to talk about what can you buy with Bitcoin, and there's plenty you can buy with Bitcoin. I mean, it's so fast, it's so easy. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to put, put yourself at risk when you do it. It's just, it's quicker, it's easier, it's more fun. But I think getting paid in Bitcoin is really fantastic, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that is, you know, if I can... Anytime I can do work for hire and get paid in Bitcoin, I do it. <laughs> I will do, I will get paid less. I'll accept less payment if it's coming in Bitcoin because, okay, so you're not paying any fees, but then you get your, your money within the Bitcoin ecosphere that you can use or more likely to save. And since the value of the currency unit is, is growing, Actually, have a stand a chance for sort of making more money in the future than you made in the present. I mean, that's a weird, John. That is bizarre. I mean, we've lived through a hundred years of inflation, you know, with one little kind of brief uh, moment of respite in the 1930s, which everybody calls the Great Depression. You know, uh, mostly we live with inflationary currency, and it changes our value system. We we tend to want to get rid of our money as quickly as possible mm-hmm. because we know it's going to depreciate over time, and we don't really have any incentive to save anything because what's what's the point? You know, the money saved, especially at zero interest, is going to be worth less in the future than today. Bitcoin overturns that entire paradigm and rewards you for holding on to your money and saving it. That's amazing. I mean, it's it, in a strange way, Bitcoin can make us less consumerist-oriented, less sort of materialistic, less grasping, and less... Um, you know, and to adopt a value system that sees further in the future, that plans for the future. Mm. Bitcoin rewards that. And so it changes the way you think about money, it changes the way you think about material property and your own spending habits. Interesting. Now, isn't that a bit of a paradox, however, because in order to really encourage the adoption and the widespread use of Bitcoin, it's important, in my opinion, for proponents of Bitcoin, people that hold Bitcoin, to use the Bitcoin and to spend the Bitcoin to grow the ecosystem and to demonstrate that we can use this as an everyday currency, an everyday medium of exchange. This is something that we saw early on with uh, trying to encourage people to use silver dimes uh, here in Austin. We 
We signed up a bunch of businesses for what we call the black and yellow pages, and we visited a bunch of farmers market vendors and, and encouraged them to accept silver dimes. But we found a lot of people that were holding silver dimes wanted to to hold on to them so they could increase in value, and they wanted to use the funny money that they saw decreasing in value. I think it's called Gresham's Law. Can you talk about that a little bit as it relates to Bitcoin and, and our effort to really get Bitcoin out to the masses? That's an extremely intelligent question, and I think you're exactly right in theory that deflationary currencies people tend to hold on, inflationary currencies people tend to spend. But I tell you, what all the merchants report to me and report to everybody is that as Bitcoin is growing in value relative to goods and services, they see use increase, not decrease. Mm. So <clears throat> we're seeing in practice the opposite, more or less, of what theory would, would predict. And, and the reason, I think, has to do with the fact that people are impressed at how quickly the value is, is growing. Mm -hmm. And they realize that they can basically spend it for free. In other words, if you buy Bitcoin at, at $10... And and suddenly it's it's at twenty dollars. Then that's like a gift of ten dollars, and you're like, hey, mm. I got an extra ten bucks. Yeah. Might as well spend it. I think that's that's the the the, the internal mental psychology. I think that people go through. But but anyway, your point about Gresham's law is is interesting, and I think it makes sense. But I'm just reporting that actually, so far in the Bitcoin ecosphere, we've seen exactly the opposite take place. The more valuable Bitcoin is, the more people tend to use it. The velocity of Bitcoin is increasing as its value is increasing, which is something of a paradox. Um, but but there it is. You know, partially, is, I think it's that that people would rather use it mm -hmm. than dollars. You know, yep. uh, and this isn't about ideology. You know, it's not about about uh, whether you believe in liberty or freedom or hate the Fed or, or, or anything like that. It's just. It only takes one or two experiences using Bitcoin. You suddenly realize that it's just a much better uh, yeah. way to go about saving money and spending money. So yeah, it's fun. We'd rather move into it than 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 use dollars. It's just true. I'm curious when the excitement's going to wear off for me. I use it all the time, but each time I send it, I'm still blown away. It's really. I feel the same. I feel the cool. same way. This is why I think that there's no stopping it. I read an article a couple of days ago about this. Just, just, just how wonderful it is to to use because you're not taking any risks. Mm -hmm. It's so much faster. The, the low transactions fees. Uh, everything's right about it. And it, it only takes just one or two uses, and you, and you have that moment of realization. Oh my God, this is amazing. Our nationalized monetary system is old fashioned and backwards and anachronistic and risky. And, and too costly, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think I think we're going to see a natural uh, move. In fact, 2014 I think is going to be the great year of retail adoption, and we've mm -hmm. already seen Overstock. Yeah. Dot com jump into the space, Tiger Direct is into the space. You know, yep. you, uh, a domain name. What's that? There's a domain name server that sells domain names. Uh, uh, you know, for Bitcoin, I mean, you can get flights now. But we're yeah. going to start seeing the big merchants move into this uh, world very quickly. A year ago, you almost couldn't name a, a, a merchant that accepted. I mean, there were, mm -hmm. but it's grassroots. You know, yeah, it was really. The early adopters. Now, a year later, we've seen a dramatic change, and so 2014 is just going to be crazy. I, I just think by the end of the year, everybody, they're going to see so many people moving into the space so fast. I mean, sometimes I think people like you and I kind of wish the future would get here uh, much more quickly, mm -hmm. uh, because we we know where it's going, right? It's, it's uh, towards freedom and away from from um, state control because the state just can't keep up. But on the other hand, if you, you know, taking a broader view. Things are happening really quickly, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, this currency just was into what, like five years ago, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is when people first heard about it. So let's see, it's two thousand two thousand nine. So yeah, I mean, things are moving really, really fast in the Bitcoin world. I mean, here's the thing: a hundred years of bad money, and not, nothing improved. Everything got worse. It's exactly like. Going from the dollar to Bitcoin is a little bit like going from the Model T to the Maserati, mm -hmm. you know. Overnight. Yeah, overnight. Yeah, yeah that's it's great. It's amazing. 
Yeah, and uh, on the price increase, I think it's really exciting. A lot of people are, are faulting the speculators, which I see is is playing a large role in driving up the price uh, outside of just the ve- people realizing the value of it. But what, what takes place, and we have all these Bitcoin millionaires now, is they're making a lot of money on the Bitcoin, and what they're doing is turn around, turning around and investing it in the ecosystem. So it kind of has this snowballing effect that just drives innovation and drives all sorts of new developments and startups. And I think it's just going to... it's it's going to reach a point where, uh, as we see on the growth curve, like it just goes straight up to the moon. I think we're, we're coming upon that maybe in the next couple of years or sooner. But yeah, I think you're right. We need to, you know, be patient and just go with it. And people that are really excited and see where it's already going can, can tend to get frustrated with, with waiting for it. But I think it's exciting to, to ride it out and, and just go along, uh, with the wave. Let me ask you this, uh, One of the reasons why I'm so excited about Bitcoin is because I think it fits in perfectly to this philosophy of sovereign living that we've been espousing, the idea that we ought not rely on centralized or coercive institutions in order to fulfill our wants and needs, in order to solve our common problems. So I see Bitcoin as being a tool to show people that we don't need to rely on government. We don't need to rely on government for money, and we can can encourage people that, hey, we don't need to rely on government for health care or defense or justice. Do you see that same type of thing? Do you see, hear that in conversations that you're having? People kind of realizing like, wow, you know, I thought this was an institution that was necessarily tied to government, but here we have it being carried out in a peer-to-peer decentralized manner. Maybe we could do that with other institutions as well. Is that something oh, you're experiencing? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, for me, look, uh, John, you know, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but you were way ahead of me philosophically on all this stuff. You know, uh, it took me... Uh, I mean, you've been advocating independent living and sort of taking responsibility for your own uh, freedoms uh, directly. You've been advocating this for a very long time. Um, I only came to this realization, you know, fairly recently, which is the reason I started Liberty.me, actually, because I wanted I wanted a, a digital space to totally get it, get dedicated to this. Mm. And the idea is that we need to stop just looking to government to give us our rights and recognize our freedoms and start to innovate and change the way we live yes. in order to protect our freedoms Give our give ourselves greater liberty, and Bitcoin is is really the archetype that shows that it is possible. Mm-hmm. Ten years ago, nobody would have believed that the free market could 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 introduce and manufacture and produce and manage a, a new global currency. There's nobody on the planet who would have believed that was possible mm-hmm. ten years ago. I mean, maybe they wanted to, but that would be a very rare kind of insight. And yet here we are, and we're seeing it actually happening. And I think you're right. It's just the beginning. I mean, you can do this in a whole host of areas, from energy provision for mm-hmm. your, for yourself, your um, in Medicare, uh, sorry, yeah, medical care and um, uh, education. You know, home security. You, you know, you do this enough, you get creative enough, mm-hmm. you get innovative enough in your own life, and you might find that one day you turn around and you're actually free. <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. That's the big hope for sure. Uh, Tell us a little bit more about the Liberty.me project. I saw you had a successful Indiegogo campaign, which is absolutely phenomenal. Congratulations. Tell us how much Bitcoin you raised on top of the uh, money through the Indiegogo. And then tell us about what the effort's all about. Yeah. So, yeah, we ended up raising, I think, passing our goal of 120. I think we ended up at something like 126. And then uh, an additional 71 and Bitcoin, I believe. Wow. So yeah, That's so it was awesome. very impressive, and it and it helps us through this difficult period of building, and it's a gigantic building process. So Liberty May is really based on two things. One is this philosophy I just mentioned, namely that, you know, we've uh, we've got the theory down. We've been working on theory for fifty years. Uh, now it's time to take that next step and start to put that theory into action within our own lives, regardless of political changes. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is not about. Or running for office or asking politicians to do things for us. This is about just taking responsibility for your for your own life. So that's the philosophical um, nature of it, and you see it. We see it reflected in the way we've structured this this kind of city city of friendship and learning and um, uh, teaching that we put together. Um, because we we have the whole site divided up into these topical categories. It's not so much. You know, high theory. It's really getting down to practical questions of, of living your life. Nice. So there's a philosophical element to it, and I'm very excited about that because I can see. You know, I've been in this world a long time, and I can see that p- 
people always ask the question, what can I do with these ideas? Mm -hmm. And in the old days, I wasn't sure I really had an answer to that. You know, like, what can you do? This is one of the reasons I, I threw myself into this project, because I want to have answers. I think we have more answers to that question now than we've ever had before. But I'm wondering, too, how many more answers are out there that we don't know about yet. So we wanted to put, pe put people into a scalable global uh, city in which these answers could be crowdsourced, where people can develop friendships, where we can share ideas <clears throat> and really uh, grow together and improve our lives together. And then hopefully develop a robust social structure um, in the online world that will eventually displace, uh, you know, the, the, the despotisms all, of, all around us. Now, that requires a tremendous amount of technology. I've been involved in technology for a very long time, and uh, two big developments happened within the last two years that made me realize that this was possible. The first one was virtualization, um, where you don't have to have these sort of steaming, heaving servers all over the place mm -hmm. um, and pay high overage fees, you know, when you have random bursts of traffic or whatever. Now you can go entirely into the cloud and, and see uh, your server work um, adapt itself to existing user uh, levels. Mm -hmm. So you can develop an infinitely scalable uh, server platform, which you could do five years ago, but it, it was unaffordable for anybody except the very rich. So when I saw that, I was like, okay, that's unbelievable. And the second big change is that the software av available for multi-blogging publishing sites, for example, every single member of Liberty Me is going to have a publishing site of his or her own. Nice. Uh, to, to, to have done that five years ago was, again, completely unaffordable, very proprietary packages, but open source software development now makes this stuff actually really available. Now to tie together what I'm doing is I'm tying together very beautiful forums with, you know, by the way, everything in the space is, is designed to be absolutely beautiful and comfortable and relaxing to, to use. Uh, tying together user forums with multi-blogging uh, uh, publishing sites that are going to be uh, pushing articles to the front page based on a karma system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, together with uh, a complete social network as ro robust and and uh, as as uh, uh, Facebook with messaging systems that's going to be entirely encrypted with a content delivery system that involves classrooms and uh, and uh, the best library of books available. So you, you start and also a newsfeed. So you put all this stuff together. You're talking about a pretty gigantic piece of machinery here. Yeah. So yeah. Heavy duty. Been building since October. And, you know, we're pushing very, very hard for a, we're going to do a closed beta on March 1st for just for those people who are already in through Indiegogo and mm -hmm. our subscribers. Then, then two weeks later, we're going to open the beta a little bit more and a little bit more. And we hope to do a live beta for, 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 to invite the whole world in by April 1st. We just want to make sure that we're stable. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like this. And web developers have told me this. They said, you know, a lot of sites out there, but nothing. Uh, th that they've ever seen has been this elaborate for awesome. one idea space. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. I, and I'm excited uh, to check it out and to be a part of it. And Wonderful. with you at the helm of it, I guess the sky's the limit. Sound, sounds like it's going to be pretty innovative well, this, and exciting. No, that me this time, John. This is what's great. I mean, this is what I'm so thrilled about, you know, being, being the CEO and getting some good uh, venture funding, you know, coming into it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, I've got the North Star profitability, but other than that, you know, our only job is to is to be as cool as possible and please our customer base. You know, nice. and that's it. so. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what Liberty Me is going to be like in a year. Um, I, I want it to grow uh, just the way Manhattan grew from you know its first purchase all the way up to uh, today. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I'd like to see. And in this space, you actually have that potential to see that kind of that kind of growth, organic and beautiful and user driven. So, so you're, I'm you're, thrilled. You're like Satoshi Nakamoto. You're just not hiding out in a cave somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's right. On the <laughs> other hand, I'm not apparently the the world's monetary system with the, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with ones and zeros. You know. So, but I don't know. You know. I mean, we're doing something just as dangerous. You know. We're we're telling people, look, uh, take some practical steps in your life to to live a freer life, and and you can actually achieve that. I and love it. That's a similar message to what you've been pro you've been promoting. I mean, I guess it was last year's Liberty Forum when I first heard you speak, and you know, I was pinned up against the wall. I mean, I couldn't believe the kind of stuff you were saying. I mean, I was next in line. I, I had to get my bearings. It took me five or ten minutes. <laughs> Well, that means a lot coming from you because you've been uh, rather inspirational to me and helped uh, 
help to shape my beliefs and so excited that so many people are coming to the next idea, the next level, which I see it as the next phase in, in the liberty evolution. We know the ideas of liberty are sound. We know they're moral. We know they're logical. How can we put them into play and demonstrate to the world that freedom really works? And I'm excited to see Liberty Me do that. And I'm excited again that you are a major Bitcoin proponent, putting on conferences, speaking across the world and, and getting the word out there about the value of Bitcoin. So I want to thank you for coming on the program and thank you for everything you're doing in those spaces. And we hope to hear from you again. John, thank you for your inspiration and all that you do. Um, and I really appreciate um, all the all the ways in which you've been way ahead of the curve here and continue to be. I think it's just lovely and, and visionary. And thank you so much for having me on your show. Well, there you have it, folks. What a great interview with Jeffrey Tucker of Liberty Me and Liza Fair Books. Big fan of Jeffrey Tucker. Very good friend. And I appreciate everything that he does for the cause of liberty and now for the cause of Bitcoin. We hope you enjoyed the program. It was jam-packed with all sorts of fun info, news, views, and tips and tools you can use. And we hope you'll check us out every week. You can find us on the Let's Talk Bitcoin network at letstalkbitcoin.com, or you can find us on sovereignbtc.com slash podcast. Remember, if you have Bitcoins, be sure you use them. Get them out into the ecosystem. Grow the counter-economy. And always, live free.